up again. Okay, so uh, how many, raise your hands, how many of you are married? Okay, how many have been married more than 20 years? Keep them up, 30 years? 40. For, Steve, you need to know that information, buddy. <laughs> At least once a year, you need to know that information, all right? More than 40 years? More than 50 years? Got some, that's all. How many years? 51? Okay. What did I see? Vern, how many years? 62? Okay. I see one more. 55. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to look to, to those three couples real quickly. Do you still get in trouble with your big fat mouse after all these years of marriage? Do we? Do we still get there? You're not sure how to answer. You're afraid you're going to get in trouble right now. With you're like, hmm. I'm going. Okay. Well, again, last week I mentioned, you know, I, I have way too many personal stories for this series. The, to narrow them down is ridiculous. <clears throat> so after about four years of marriage, Rachel and I are coming up on 16 years. You see how I knew that, Steve? Do you see how I knew that? Okay. <laughs> so we're coming up on 16 years this summer. And uh, after we'd been married about four years, uh, Rachel decided that she wanted to, well, she had haircuts before, but she was going to get like a significant haircut this time. And I've always loved her long hair. But she got, I don't know, what's this, I don't know what the style is called. You do it real short in the back, and then it kind of gets longer as it comes around the front. You, you ladies, they're all, ladies are like, yeah, guys are like, <laughs> beats me. So, so she gets that. And of course, what, what do, guys, what do the ladies say that you just look like a deer in the headlights afterwards. Like, what do you think, honey? Because she already knows, like, I'm, I'm, I like her long hair. And if I was a wise husband after four years of being married, what would I have said? Or at least nothing, right? <laughs> at least I should have said, like, nothing. But I remember the next day waking up and she was, like, asking me about the hair and stuff and I said, I got to admit, when I first woke up this morning, I, I thought I was sleeping next to a boy. <laughs> I told you I had plenty of material for this series, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. I'm still kind of making up for that one. 14. <laughs> 12 years later. I love you, honey. And I love your gorgeous long hair. Let me just say that now, okay? Have you ever gotten in trouble because of your big fat mouth? You know, last week we talked about the topic of complaining, because we all do it, right? And the primary reason that we do it is because we constantly take our focus off of God and we place it on ourselves instead. We lose focus on the bigger picture of what God is doing, and instead we focus on our own agenda and our own wants and how they aren't being met, and that leads to plenty of complaining, which in turn lends itself to plenty of things that we later regret coming out of our big fat mouths. Now, words have tremendous power. Our words have the power to give life, and they have the power to take life away. And Jesus tells us that we speak from the overflow of our hearts, so everything that comes out of our mouths reflects something that is going on at a deeper level inside of us. We need to own our words, and we need to own our responses. My wife, my wife with the beautiful long hair, my wife, can't, see, I told you I'm still making up for it. My wife came across this illustration this past week that she passed along to me, and it's a great example of this idea of taking ownership for our words and our responses. This is how the illustration goes. You're holding a cup of coffee when someone comes along and bumps into you, making you spill your coffee everywhere. Why did you spill the coffee? You spilled the coffee because there was coffee in your cup. Had there been tea in the cup? you would have spilled tea. The point is, whatever is inside the cup is what will spill out. Therefore, when life comes along and shakes you, which will happen, whatever is inside you will come out. It's easy to fake it until you get rattled. So we have to ask ourselves, what's in my cup? When life gets tough, what spills out? Joy, gratefulness, peace, and humility? Or does anger, bitterness, harsh words and other negative reactions come out. You get to choose. Today, let's work towards filling our cups with gratitude, forgiveness, joy, words of affirmation, kindness, gentleness, and love for others. Good words. 
Every day we make hundreds and probably thousands of choices of what comes out of our mouth. And the reality is when things get more difficult and we feel life squeezing us, our true character comes out more clearly. And let's face it, sometimes we just come up short, don't we? We can tell a lot about ourselves and others by how we face difficult people and difficult circumstances. Now, this guy here, this is Ryan Shazier. If you're a football fan, you may know him. He's the middle linebacker for my beloved Pittsburgh Steelers. And Ryan has been one of the best middle linebackers in the league for several years now. His speed and his overall athleticism, they match the best in the business. And he was having a terrific year until tragedy struck. In a game against the Cincinnati Bengals in December, during what would normally be a routine tackle, Ryan was hurt and immediately reached for his back as he laid on the field, not able to move his lower body. And it was obvious right away that this was not a minor injury. As the medical staff rushed on the field, the announcers were clearly concerned about what they had just witnessed. There was little doubt that his season was over. And as it turned out, Ryan suffered a dangerous spinal injury that not only ended his season, but could very well still end his career. I'd say that counts as having some turmoil and stress in your life, wouldn't you? I'd say that that counts as being shaken up pretty good by life's circumstances, wouldn't you? So what came out? What spilled out of Ryan Shazier's mouth and heart? Would we blame him for being angry? Would we blame him for having doubt or fear or resentment? But all that we have seen come from Ryan's mouth in the last two and a half months since this incident is this. A man who is constantly smiling. A man who is constantly thankful. A believer in Jesus Christ who is always seeing the positive and the good and the hopeful in his situations. He's a man who is constantly encouraging his family and his friends and his teammates. He's a man who Steelers ownership says he has never asked the question, why me? He's a man who still sees a very bright future, even though it still has a cloud of uncertainty over what that will look like. But that uncertain future doesn't bother him because he knows the one who holds the future in his hands. See, when we get our relationship with Jesus right, when it becomes the number one relationship in our lives, when we keep our focus on his plan and not our own, then the natural overflow from our mouth, regardless of the situation, the circumstances around us, will be filled with hope, joy, and promise. That's true for the topic of complaining, which we focused on last week, and it's true for the topic that we're going to focus on today, which is criticism. Now, when I'm talking about criticism, I'm not talking about the constructive feedback that we give because we care about people and we want to see them get better. What I'm talking about is the critical, nitpicking, unkind, uninformed, cruel criticism that so often goes on around us and unfortunately in which we are a part of as well. And if you think you don't criticize much, I'd have to challenge you on how naive you might be on just how often you do it. You see, the problem of criticism is it's really difficult to see in the mirror because we often feel very justified in criticizing others if we believe that what they are doing is irresponsible, immature, or unwise. We're convinced that we know the right way to act in their situation, and nobody can convince us otherwise. And we're all guilty of doing this, aren't we? We've all done this with family and friends. We see how they spend their money. We see how they raise their kids, how they dress, how they talk, how they drive. And we jump to all kinds of conclusions about them that are critical and judgmental. You know, this problem with being critical of others, that's nothing new. It wasn't new to the early church either. In fact, in the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul had to warn the people about it because it was happening so regularly among them. And this is what he wrote to them in Galatians 5. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. If your words are constantly critical, if you're always cutting down people, if you're always harsh with your word choices, be careful 
about destroying one another? What if for some of you, your critical words are actually destroying the potential intimacy that you could have in a marriage or with, with close friends? What if, what if your critical words are driving a wall between you and your children? What if there are those of you, your critical words are actually keeping you from sharing the goodness of Jesus because people can't get over how critical you are about anything and everything? Be careful that your words don't end up hurting those around you. There's so many verses throughout Scripture that talk about the importance of the words that come out of our mouths. And these verses confirm the power that those words can have on people. Look at what it says in Proverbs 12, 18. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Some people cut. They hurt and they criticize. But other people speak words of wisdom, and those words build up. They don't tear down. They create healing. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Ephesians 4. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Imagine if we actually made this like something we live by. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. He says, don't let unhelpful, unwholesome, impure words come out of your mouth. Don't tear other people down. Let the only words you speak be words that are helpful for building others up according to their needs. And here's what I hope we'll really understand. You and I constantly forget how a single word of criticism can pierce someone's soul and stick with them for years and years. And on the other side, we forget how God can use a single word of encouragement to build somebody up, to give them the faith to go on. Is that true for your story? Is that true for your life? Can you sitting sitting here right now, Can you think back to something critical somebody said to you that you can remember right now, years and years later? How many of you can how many of you can do that? Boom. Didn't take much time at all, did it? What about the flip side of that? How many of you sitting here today can remember something encouraging, something positive, something life infusing that somebody said to you that was an encouragement and has stuck with you to this day? There are there is power. In our words, our words have power. Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs and benefits those who listen. When I went to college in Pennsylvania, I went to Grove City College, and I got my, I was in a a music singing group. And I, one year I ended up being voted in as the president of that group. Now, I don't know about you, but did any of you, like the first time you got a position that really felt like it had a little bit of authority to it, let it go to your head a little bit too much? And please tell me there's at least one person. that. Can. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just going to skip the story and move on because that's just downright embarrassing, okay? So... So I, I, I was just a jerk. I just, I just monopolized meetings. I just, boom, boom, this is what you do, boom, boom, this is what you do, you do, you do. I mean, it was just, it was terrible. I was terrible. And I remember sitting down with another student who was part of this group, and I remember him coming and, and just said, you know what? You are like the worst leader in the history of leaders. <laughs> like, you don't do this right, you don't do this right, you don't do that. Like, you have no business being a leader of other people, okay? Now, I still remember that to this day. What if I had decided to allow that to dictate my journey? Because fortunately, at the same time, I had a professor that called me in. He was our, we had to have a, like a sponsoring professor for each of the organizations on the campus. And he had me come in And he knew everything that went on, and I was like, okay, I did this and this and this and this. And uh, he's like, "Uh, Chris, that's not good. (laughs) He said, but here's the good news. You're just going to get better at it. You're going to get better at it. And he started telling me about when he first kind of started stepping into some significant leader positions and, and the decisions that he made and the ego that he had in some of those situations. And his words started to lift me up. 
He spoke life into me. He could have sat there and just pointed out all the critical. And we spent some time, and you know, that's where we get into the constructive criticism part of things, which is not our focus for today. We do that part. But he chose to speak life into me. And I had a choice to make at that time when I looked to the future and what I could be and what kind of a leader I could be. I could have gone down this path. I could have believed this, this other student said, to be truth and been like, all right, I'm done. I'm not even going to try anymore. Not even going to try stepping up, being in leadership, trying to be creative, come with new direction, new ways of doing things. Not even going to try anymore. But because I had a professor who believed in me, and I still can remember his words verbatim to this day, the power of our words. We forget how much one word of criticism can take somebody down. And we forget the power of one word of encouragement. How God can use that to build faith and hope into someone who needs it. Our words have the power of life and they have the power of death. This other student, he was a life taker in that situation, but my professor was a life giver. So what kind of person do you want to be? What type of person do you want to be known as? Because it really comes down to two choices. One choice is to be a fault finder. One choice is to be a fault finder. And this, quite honestly, is what most people are. Because of our sin nature, when we tend to look to find what's wrong before we find what's right. You can take a relatively good person and you can pick them apart before you even get to lunch, can't you? I don't like the way you walk. I don't like the way you dress. I don't like the way you chew. I don't like the way you drive. I don't like the jokes you tell. In fact, now that I think about it, I don't even like the way you breathe. Right? Whatever it is, it's so easy to be a fault finder, isn't it? That comes naturally for us. If you're a fault finder, let me remind you, when we're fault finders, we are a lot like the Pharisees from the early church, people who claim to be the leaders and examples of faith, but in reality, they were just extremely judgmental and shallow people. They were full of pride, and they thought they knew what was best, and we follow in their footsteps a lot, don't we, if we're being honest? We think we know what's best. And we also have to catch ourselves when we're fault finders because we're criticizing from a distance. We don't have all the facts in the situation. How many of you have ever been somewhere and in your mind you criticized how somebody was parenting a child? We've all done that. We have no idea what they've been going through. We don't have all the context for what has led up to that moment. But we sure feel free to confidently assume that we know better than that other person how the situation should be handled, right? We do it all the time. We do that at our workplaces. We do that among our, our family and our friends. We, we criticize our community leaders, our church leaders, our nation's leaders, all the time not having the whole picture in front of us. So what's the answer, Chris? Well, I've spent countless hours thinking about it and trying to come up with the best theological wording for it and the insight that will reflect the depth of what we needed today. And, and this is what I came up with. Knock it off. All right? All right, it didn't take hours to come up with that one. All right? Knock it off. Recognize the sin nature in ourselves that desires to be critical all the time and make a different choice of what kind of attitude that you will have and what kind of words you will use. We choose to be fault finders. The good news is we can make a different choice. Instead of being fault finders, we can choose to be a hope dealer. Now, for those of you who might be listening online later on, that was hope dealer with an H, all right? Uh, not the other kind. Dealt with that enough during jury duty the last couple of weeks there, all right? So hope dealer. Every day, you and I make choices that decide whether or not we are fault finders or hope dealers. And the Apostle Paul, he recognized the power of hope. This is what he says in Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may what? Overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
In his time here on earth, Jesus was a chief hope dealer. Any time that he would speak with people who were, who were far from having a relationship with him, he wasn't focused on tearing people down. He was focused on building them up. He wasn't going to let any unwholesome talk come out of his mouth, but only that which was helpful for building life into other people. He was the supreme hope dealer. And whenever someone would sin, the Pharisees would point out that sin and they would accuse Jesus would come along, and he'd call the sin out for what it was, but then he would offer hope to walk away from the bondage of that sin. There's the story of when a woman was caught in adultery. If you know that story, what did the Pharisees do? They were focused on pointing out everything that was wrong. The Pharisees said, we need to stone her. But Jesus knelt instead, he knelt down beside and he started writing in the sand. And we're not sure what he was writing, Some scholars believe that he was maybe writing something like the sins of the Pharisees because one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they all started to walk away, walked away. And then what did Jesus do? After everybody else left, he turns to this woman who was broken and full of shame and said, where are the fault finders? Where are the fault finders? Where are the accusers? Where are those who tried to condemn you? And she looked up and she said, they're all gone. And so Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Don't do this anymore. There's a better way. He was a hope dealer to this woman, pointing her towards forgiveness, pointing her towards real love and real life. What do you want to be? Do you want to be a fault finder? That's what the Pharisees were. That's what our spiritual enemy, the devil, is too. The prince of darkness, the father of lies, the great deceiver, the accuser. But who is Jesus? He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the living hope. He is the blessed hope. He is our hope. I want to be a hope dealer. How about you? There are power in words. Critical words sting. You forget that when you criticize your spouse, what that does to self-esteem and intimacy. You have no idea when you're hard on your kids how it belittles them and distances you from them. You have no idea how foolish you look when you criticize and criticize and criticize, thinking that it makes you look better, but it just makes you look insecure and mean-spirited. But you also forget how powerful one word of encouragement can be, how God can use that to change a life. You forget that when you speak the best about others, how God can build them up. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs. So your kid may not take after you as far as being an athlete or an academic scholar, but they have a great heart. Tell them that. You're amazing. I love what I see in you. I love the way that you speak about others. I love the way that you serve others. Build them up. Husbands, your wife may not be the most organized, but she's an incredible mom. Instead of picking her apart for what she's not, build her up for what she is. I love the way you love our kids. I could have never married anybody that could pour more life into our children. Wives, your husband may not even win the yard of the month mower. All right, He doesn't like to mow the yard. It's bad. There's crooked lines everywhere. But next time he does, you just say, You're so sexy out there in your black socks, pushing the lawnmower around. (laughs) I love what I see, all right? We get it. Words of life, people. That's what we're talking about. Words of life. And you have the power to use them every single day. You're having trouble getting that image out of your head, aren't you, (laughs) Dar? Hey, preteens and teenagers, listen up. You are right now among perhaps the toughest group of people on the planet when it comes to being critical. Am I right? You guys are at a tough age for that stuff. And a lot of that comes from being insecure. A lot of kids your age tear other people down so that they can feel better about themselves. And I'm here to tell you this. You are better than that. Don't seek to be normal. 
Don't seek to be normal. I know that's the common thing. All of us that have been there, that was what we wanted, right? We just wanted to be normal at that age. And I'm telling you, don't try to be normal. Normal stinks. Normal at your age is immature, self-centered, and judgmental. You were created for something better than that. So I'm going to give you the same words of advice, deep theological advice I gave earlier to the rest of the crowd. Knock it off. All right? Catch yourself when you're doing that and make a different choice. God's got a better plan for your life than you to follow after than trying to be normal. His plan for you is so, so much better than that. And we believe in you. We believe in you. We believe that you can be the generation that makes a difference. We believe in you. When we choose to stay close to God, we become less critical people. When we're fully aware of our own sinfulness, of our natural tendency to choose our way over God's way, we recognize just how much God has saved us from. We see the magnitude of God's grace, and because of who he is and what he's done for us, we will not waste time criticizing others. Because of who God is, because of what he's done, because of how he's forgiven us, because of how he has given us hope, because how he has loved people who don't deserve that love, we will not tear down. We will build up. We are people of God. We are hope dealers. We point people to Jesus, the living hope. We point people to Jesus, the King of Kings. We point people to Jesus, our Savior, our King, and our Lord. We point people to hope. We are not fault finders. Anybody can be a fault finder. Pharisees are fault finders. The devil is a fault finder. We are followers of Christ. And because we seek to be faithful followers of Christ, we will speak words of healing. We will speak words of life. We choose the better way that God has laid out for us to follow in the example of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, everybody here this morning, each person in here, you have a story. You have a story to tell. How you live out your life is the story that you tell. And you are making a decision every day, each moment. When you open your mouth, you are adding to that story one way or the other. So my question is, when people look at your life, when people look at how you're living out your life, how you interact with people, and what is coming out of your mouth, what is the story that they are hearing? What is the story that you want to tell? Now, Nick and the worship team are going to lead us in this closing song, and that's what I want to be on your minds as we go through this, that the words of this song called my story, and as we're singing that out, I hope that you're praying to God going, God, that's what I want. This is what I want, my story to tell my family. This is the story I want my story to tell my church family, my community. This is the story I want my story to tell those who are far from you so that they will be drawn to you as a result of knowing and seeing my story. So let's stand together for this final song. Make this your prayer as we sing this. Make this your story. Two things, love that song, love, love, love that song. Two things I had to write down that just resonated with me this week as I listened to that song over and over again, getting ready for today. For the grace that is greater than all my sin. See, guys, if we keep that right here, if we're constantly reminded of how great God's grace is, you don't go down the road of complaining and being critical. You don't look at other people and pass judgment quickly. Why? Because it's right here. I am remembering God's grace in my life. I'm remembering all of my big fat mouth moments during my life, all the decisions I have made, and how God's grace is greater.
than all of those. And when that is fresh in my mind, something changes in my heart. And I don't have the need or desire to look at other people and complain and be critical. Does that make sense? When we stay close to Jesus, God honors that. And it shows up that when life comes along and shakes you up, what pours out can be something beautiful. And that's what it's supposed to be. That when people look at the people of God, there's supposed to be something different about us. And very few times in life does that show up more than when life shakes us to the core. Let's pray. God, thank you for reminding us today of just how great your grace for us is. And God, when we get forgetful, as we do all the time, would you bring it fresh to our minds again just how amazing your grace is? When we look back at our own lives and we see all of the terrible decisions that we have made, all the terrible things that we have done, all the terrible things that we have said, and the fact that you loved us enough to send your son Jesus to take that penalty away from us that we deserved, that your grace is greater than all of our sins. And God, that has to spill over into the rest of our lives. That has to be something that is so real for us, that is so tangible in our daily lives, that it seeps into our hearts. So that when we look at other people around us who are just as broken and messed up as we are, our first inclination won't be to complain and to criticize and to judge. But instead, we will move to compassion and kindness and understanding. And we know, God, that that is our, not our natural desire. Our sin nature will always push us more towards that complaining and criticizing. But the power of the Holy Spirit in us and through us can change our heart and our mind so that we look at the world around us, so that we look at the people around us completely different and through a new set of eyes, through your eyes. So help us to do that, Lord, this week. Help us to see the people around us, to catch ourselves when we maybe jump quickly to that complaining or criticizing and to make a different choice, to make a choice that is honoring to you, to make a choice that recognizes the value and the worth of that other person, to make a choice that will draw that person to you because they see our story. And there's something so amazing about our stories, and that's because you are in our stories that ultimately it draws them to wanting that same relationship and to having a similar story of how, no matter what they've done, your grace is greater. Thank you for being so, so good to us, Lord. Thank you for blessing us far beyond anything we could possibly deserve. Help us go out this week and tell a good story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Prayer team in the corner, if you'd like to pray with uh, anybody else. Uh, otherwise, hopefully we'll see a bunch of you Wednesday at WOW. Speaking up again